Okay, so thanks very much. We've had kind of a, a bit of um, discussion around this already this morning, but I've been asked to review uh, some of the clinical data on the use of the long-acting uh, treatment options. Um, and as this audience knows, uh, the only one that is currently approved in any part of the world is the long-acting rolpilverine together with long-acting, and it should see cabotegavir, not dolutegavir, uh, and that there is one in development, which is the lenacapavir with this latisvir, uh, but more are coming. So I'm going to take it more from the complete data to kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, how we might use these things and some of the things that you might want to start thinking about um, if these things are going to start to get uh, introduced into uh, your uh, armamentarium. So who's going to benefit most? I think generally it's those who don't want to or have trouble in taking uh, oral medication. And frequently it's people who say, you know, I, I, I try really hard to be adherent, but sometimes I miss and I can't remember that extra pill. Uh, but I think probably the most common um, patient in my experience is someone who says, every time I swallow my HIV pills, it makes me think that I have HIV. And to not have to take pills every day uh, will be a, a, an important issue. Another one is people who often travel a lot or or do a lots of business things and they don't want to take their pill bottles with them and it provides them again that degree of confidentiality. <clears throat> but you have to, you know, the long acting injectables are not a reason for non-adherence. So those people who are not adherent to pills, they're not going to be adherent to needles either. And there can be potentially more risk of them not being adherent to the injectable medications because the pharmacokinetic tail will put them in a position where their virus may develop resistance. Uh, obviously, you can't give them these medications if there are significant drug interactions, uh, and you also cannot give these medications to those with underlying mutations to any of the components of the combination. So I am not going to go through the clinical trials uh, in detail because we've all seen them a hundred times before, but briefly to outline that there have been ma four major pivotal trials that looked at oral cabotegravir um, uh, together with uh, 3TC. The LATTE study was the initial dose uh, finding study and they were comparing it to oral cabotegravir with the bacavir and 3TC. The FLARE was a study in treatment naive with that caveat again that there was the oral lead in and then they went on the injectable drug. The ATLAS study was a switch study in, in people with undetectable uh, viral load and it was a comparison to continuing on their standard therapy. And then the ATLAS 2 study allowed people to compare every four weeks uh, to every eight weeks. And sort of the bottom lines of all of those studies is that the injectables worked as well as the oral comparators, so by statistical means they were all thought to be non-inferior. There were very few people who failed, and of the few who failed, the development of resistance is extremely uncommon to either one or both of the drugs. <clears throat> but there were no major adverse reactions seen, and from the trials, the optimal timing is every 30 days, but the every 60-day uh, schedule worked for most patients. Uh, there were, <coughs> excuse me, a few failures in the ATLAS studies, and the company has been working very hard to try and identify potential risk factors uh, for people in whom this drug may not be appropriate, and, and we'll go into that table in a minute. So this is just uh, one of the curves demonstrating in ATLAS 2 the difference between every uh, four weeks or every eight weeks, and you can see that the, the um, uh, estimates and confidence intervals were t quite tight and that we do allow for either dosing uh, interval. So as they went through these few virologic failures, they tried to determine, are there risk factors? Are there people that we can identify um, in whom uh, this um, may not work as well? 
And there's a few that have been identified, is those obviously who have underlying um, resistant mutations to any component of the combination, particularly to the real pilverine component. Uh, those individuals who had uh, less optimal PK parameters. For some reason, the HIV-1 subtype A6, A1, which is predominant in Russia and some in France, seems to not respond so well to this virus. And those individuals who had a BMI of greater than 30 um, kilograms per meter square. But the four, every four weeks versus eight weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, did not seem to be a significant risk factor. But the bottom line is you don't have to have all of these to fail, but rather it's an accumulative number. And the more of these risk factors you have, the less likely you're going to respond. Um, so again, we went through kind of our clinic database and sort of said how many people would have an underlying real pilverine mutation, obesity, uh, and, um, and this uh, clade of virus in our clinic, the number of individuals that would not qualify is in fact fairly small. Uh, they went on to further study this and presented this data at the Glasgow conference uh, just a few weeks ago. And as they've watched this cohort over time, they've now watched these cohorts for three years. There's only been 1.4% of individuals with virologic failure. So uh, numerically, that's 23 individuals over 1,651. And again, if they had none, none of those factors, no one had confirmed virologic failure. If they had three or more of these factors, which was only 39 people, now 20% of them failed. So these are really the factors that you need to keep in mind um, if you're going to select this drug. And just one in isolation is not enough for you not, not to use the medication. So can there be problems? Well, yes, there can be pain at the place where it's injected. Uh, and it's inconvenient. And the problem is this is an intramuscular injection and therefore it's not something you can do yourself uh, or your partner or your friend. Uh, and so they do have to come to the clinic at the, at the current time. People are working on various strategies to have this done in pharmacies and other places. Uh, and they're also working towards some sort of device where people will be able to administer it themselves. But at the moment it does mean coming to the clinic. So that's a balance for patients. What's harder for you, taking a pill every day or coming here every month or two? Um, adverse reactions are quite uncommon and it was the reason why they had that oral run-in so that you tried the oral medications first to make sure that everything would be okay. The FDA has eliminated that now. You don't need to do the oral run-in phase because they really didn't have a lot of uh, serious reactions. Uh, that being said, I had a young lady a couple of weeks ago she did the oral run-in, everything was fine. We gave her one intramuscular injection. She had a very severe uh, pruritic reaction with hives uh, in the clinic, uh, resolved quickly with Benadryl. She says, I wanna do it again. I said, no, you're not. Um, and uh, that's been the one adverse reaction that I saw. There's concern around pregnancy. You know, we don't know the safety of this drug in pregnancy. Uh, however, um, if somebody is on this drug and gets pregnant, this drug is going to be there for much of the duration of the pregnancy. So we are allowing women to continue this drug and we are trying to continue to follow their outcomes of their babies. There's been no adverse reactions that have been noted yet. Another issue is what if something new comes up and they then require some sort of drug that's going to interact with what, what's inside them. So that can be an issue and obviously not something that we can predict and something that we have to work around should that happen. And at the moment, uh, they get the real pilverine in one buttock and they get the cabotegavir in the other buttock. Um, but perhaps in the future, we will be looking towards different injectables and there will be more challenges if they end up on different schedules. Uh, if you give this one this month, that one that month, that will be a problem. <coughs> The main problem has been the injection site reactions, and those tend to be worse at the beginning and kind of fizzle out over time. And I think that's a combination of the learning curve of the nurse and the learning curve of the patient in terms of being able to tolerate it. But over the studies that have been done, very few people have had to stop the medication because of the adverse reactions. And they don't end up with the big tender nodules that we used to see um, with T20. 
Patients who like, like this love it. The problem with these uh, patient-reported outcomes are these are people in clinical trials, and of course you wouldn't volunteer to go into a clinical trial with a needle if you didn't want a needle. So if you want to go in this trial, you'll love it. And most of our people that have gone on to this, they love it. Uh, it's the pharmacokinetic tail that I alluded to that you have to be careful about. So if somebody is really non-adherent, and I described a patient earlier this week that I've had nothing but trouble uh, in terms of him taking any medication. We finally agreed that we would use this. He was very good for his first three injections and then came 12 weeks late for his next one. Real problem because you've got that pharmacokinetic tail which allows for the virus to grow and if the virus grows in a sub-inhibitory concentration of drug, he's gonna be resistant. What are the challenges in your office? Okay, scheduling is a nightmare, right? So all these people are on a once or two monthly basis and they have a little window and you have to have them in the right day. Uh, the oral lead-in was a challenge, but we don't do that anymore. But you gotta have a place in your office where you're gonna keep the drug, you need to have, make sure somebody reorders it and you have your supply on hand. If you're in a small clinic and you have one nurse who gives this, what happens if she's away? Who's gonna be the backup? us. Um, and then we do allow for oral bridging. So if people are going to miss some of their doses that they need to have some oral medication to cover them through. And initially we thought that that had to be cabotegravir and real pilverine, but now most people recommend it can be anything that you can use to bridge them. But again, you're going to have the challenge like us. If you're on an insurance policy, they will only give you 30 days of one drug, and how do you have that bridge? And we've had to fight with insurance companies to make sure that we have that. What do you do when they don't show? How do you drag them back? Um, the cost and coverage for us, fortunately, the cost is the same as the pills, so we've been able to get it on our formulary. I hope you can too. And then there's COVID. We got approval for this drug March 20th, 2020, and it was a nightmare to try and implement this in the clinic with uh, patients not being able to come uh, because of the restrictions of COVID. Uh, so as I alluded to, they did some analysis of the uh, direct to inject and really people are not finding a problem. So unless you're really nervous, and I must say I don't even bother with this anymore, I just go direct to inject and don't necessarily do the oral uh, lead-in portion of the, of the protocol. So that's for treatment. Uh, the same injectable cabotegavir has been used now for prevention. Uh, and clearly we needed alternatives to oral prep because we've all learned that patients have difficulty in maintaining that for the long term, that adherence has been one of the major challenges uh, of oral prep. Um, and so there have been two major studies that have been done now, HPTN 083, which was done in cisgendered men and, tri and transgendered women, uh, 4,500 4, participants around the world. Subsequently followed up with HPTN 084, which was largely in cisgendered women, uh, largely in Africa. Both of them showing statistically significant uh, decrease in HIV infections relative uh, to uh, tenofovir and FTC, and in fact, superior, which led to the DSMBs uh, closing these trials early. So these drugs truly have a role in prevention. These are the two Kaplan-Meier curves. The top one is for the men, the bottom one is for the women. And you can see how dramatically um, these drugs have been effective in decreasing the risk of HIV transmission. Uh, transmissions, however, have happened. Uh, and as you can see, this is in the study in the men. There were 25 infections in the patients who received cabotegravir relative to 73 infections uh, in the people on the tenofovir arm. On the tenofovir arm, mostly related to non-adherence and poor drug concentrations. Uh, this is the data in women. Again, four infections in the cabotegravir arm versus 36 infections in the tenofovir arm. Again, largely being driven by adherence. But it's not the entire uh, story, and there have been some breakthroughs in both of these cases, some of them unexplained. People got the needles, people got the needles on time, the pharmacokinetics were right, but there have been these very rare breakthrough infections that people continue um, to work through. 
Uh, in the women's study, there were no cases of, of resistance detected. In the men's case, there were some cases of resistance in some of the breakthrough uh, cases. <clears throat> And they've been really carefully trying to understand the reasons uh, for these breakthroughs. Some of them were in cases that were not identified at the time that the PrEP was started. Some of them is there was a little bit of a long interval. Anyway, the analysis continues. The bottom line is it works most of the time, but there occasionally are failures. Again, what was the main problem in the prevention trials? Again, the main problem was the injection site reactions, and similarly to the data that we saw in treatment, that tends to settle down with time as people get, get used to it. And uh, very few people have had to um, stop the treatment because of the severity of those reactions. The one thing you have to be very careful about is whether or not somebody has uh, developed an infection and so there are careful protocols when this is used prophylactically to make sure that someone has not acquired HIV disease because if you have the virus again growing in the in the face of a uh, integrase monotherapy then you run the risk of integrase resistance and the problem is is because these drugs suppress viral replication there may be a delay in antibody production and some of the rapid tests for HIV may fail uh, to detect infection and, uh, and uh, so additional testing may be done. This has been led to an awful lot of controversy about how much testing we can do and how much we can afford and by what, what means in order to prevent uh, people uh, uh, breaking through with infection. But the issue is, is that this was so effective and so accepted, particularly by the women. And if many of you remember, all of the PrEP trials of tenofovir in women were dismal, with the outcomes horrible, practically zero. But the women seem to be able to accept this. Again, I think it's because it helps maintain confidentiality. It gives them some control over this. And these are just some of the models of what bringing cabotegravir to sub-Saharan Africa will do in terms of the incidence of new cases of HIV and the number of deaths per year. And so there is a big push throughout the world to be able to make this drug available uh, throughout the world uh, for prevention given its pre uh, effectiveness in prevention. But it will not be the answer, and coming to the clinic to get an injection every one or two months is not for everyone. And there does continue to be a number of new technologies that are being developed, both for treatment as well as for prevention, and I think we all look forward to these. They have been slow in coming to us, and I think you know will take a while uh, in order for us to see them. Uh, so I'm going to close up there and... Uh, take any urgent questions or wait to the panel.